Nocturne. In 1933, a man known as The Stranger works for an organization in the United States known as The Spook House. Their job is to hunt down and exterminate supernatural forces of evil. This game has four chapters. In the first, you go to a small village in Germany which has recently reported werewolves and vampires. And it takes you to a sort of castle, or the ruins of one. And you will face a very powerful vampire. In the second one, you go to a small, and I believe fictional, town in the south that has become infested with zombies. In the third, you go to Chicago. This is where it gets silly. Mobsters are now being assembled after they've been torn apart by machine gun fire in a sort of Frankenstein's monster kind of way. And in the fourth one, you go to a former Spook House operative who left in anger when they started taking partially or completely monstrous creatures as agents. Mind you, these agents are under control. At first, when you arrive at his mansion, you are told that he's having problems with supernatural forces, but it soon turns out, this isn't a spoiler, that he's actually kind of testing you, and you will run through his mansion solving puzzles, and fighting pretty much every kind of monster that you can think of. That's one of the really great things about this. You get to fight pretty much every supernatural monster to go by them chapter by chapter. In the first one, you fight werewolves, and vampires, and there are also a few ghouls, some golems, and there are, I don't know what the actual name is, but it's a sort of demon, it has wings, it looks like a giant bat, only it's gray. In the second one, you fight zombies, and the delicious thing is, unlike certain other survival horror games where you fight zombies, in this one you actually get to take them apart. And one of the weapons you'll be using is an axe. You also get a shotgun. And you can just take their arms off and they'll keep coming at you until you completely put them down. You do also fight, I don't want to give too many details about the second chapter, but you fight some creatures. In the third one, you mainly fight these mobsters, and most of them are really just regular mobsters. There is a recurring foe in the third one, Smiley the Mobster. He is freaking huge and he has been put back together and I already said he's recurring so I can give away that they put him back together. When you you take him apart they put him back together. It's pretty awesome. And in the fourth one you fight everything. You fight Vampires, werewolves, succubi, I think is the plural, you know, succubus. 
the flying things, various demons, stone golems, walking skeletons that if you take them apart, they will just come back together and attack you again. You can take one of their bones and try to hide it from them because then they won't attack you because before they get that bone back. But the more times you blow it apart, the faster it comes back together. I'm not kidding here. If you take it apart, let's say 10, 15 times, it will literally come back together almost as, almost right away. It's really cool. This is a kind of overlooked survival horror game, and it's really unfortunate because it gets right what a lot of them kind of don't. Other than what I've already mentioned, there is a great aiming system. Every single gun has some kind of light attached to it. A flashlight or a laser sight. And yes, obviously that didn't exist back in the 30s, but never mind, it's awesome. Think like Tomb Raider, the Tomb Raider games, you know. It'll aim and you can tell when you're going to hit something. You can turn off the auto-aiming, but it's really not suggested. Also, the standard guns of the Stranger are two handguns, two 45 caliber handguns. And if you leave it on auto-aim, he can be aiming at two different foes at the same time. You can literally be shooting at two different ones at the same time. That's awesome. The guns are a nice selection also, other than the 45s. I already mentioned the shotgun. You have a crossbow, which is, of course, excellent for hunting vampires. The gun has several kinds of bullets. One that's with, like, silver for werewolves, of course. I don't know exactly what's in the anti-vampire bullets, but never mind. There's one that's really good for demons. You also have this cross with a blade. It's like you, you hold up the cross and there's a blade at the top of, you know, the one that... and you can stab and cut apart your enemies. In the third one you of course have Tommy guns. And this also has a very good healing feature. You know how in Resident Evil and Silent Hill, at least as far as I've played, I haven't played a lot of Resident Evil, honestly. If you are being attacked, you pretty much can't go to the menu and heal yourself. In this one, you don't have to go to a menu. It's a it's an inventory system that you just cycle through with, you know, the keys on the keyboard. You don't have to go into a menu. And you can set it to heal on its own if you would have died from the wounds otherwise. And this is really good because you can't heal yourself if you're being attacked. So you can literally, you know, make him heal himself if you can't be doing that. And this will save you a lot. You do, of course, like in all survival horror, have to make sure that you always have a lot of bullets and a lot of healing items. There are many puzzles and a lot of them are really good. This has a similar kind of angle system to at least the early Resident Evil games. I would say that the angles are more extreme than in Resident Evil. They're very much like old classic horror films. Sometimes they're very far away from the character. And yes, sometimes you can't really tell exactly where you're going. And that is a little unfortunate. That is one of the big drawbacks about this game. Maybe why it didn't do so well. Basically, if you don't run off screen because you might die if you do so, and 
you know, don't jump unless you're sure where you're going to land, it works out, and I would say it's more than worth tolerating these angles, because the game is a ton of fun. You can save whenever you want, and I know some people are going to find that to be, you know, way too easy, you know. Some people don't think that you should be able to in survival horror, and I can see the arguments for it, but, you know, you choose if you want to make use of it or not. The story is great. I would actually have liked if they spent even more time on the story and more time on the characters. There's a very nice, kind of quirky cast of characters in the spook house. Because there's like no one normal in the entire spook house, in the entire organization, at least you don't meet them. Well, maybe the secretary, who you just have to say a password to, is more or less a normal person, but other than that, you're led by this old army guy who has, I think it's like a hook for a hand, and one of the hands and eye patch. You yourself, you know, have this mysterious past, you know, he's the Wolverine kind of, you know, mostly completely silent, speaks in a really badass voice, you know, always wearing these sunglasses, which I think are actually night vision goggles, which are completely useless in the game, let it be known. You have a hat, long, flappy coat. It is actually a little unfortunate that this flappy coat, they apparently didn't really program it so that it only moves when there is supposed to be wind. I was playing it with my now ex-fiance, and no, that's not why I you know, we're no longer together, she pointed out that it was actually flapping indoors. I hadn't even noticed that. But yes, that is quite true and slightly unfortunate. But the physics are quite nice in this, I would say. You can really feel when you're blowing apart enemies or when they really hurt you. Also, there's a lot of gore and it's not just of the enemies you actually can come apart yourself if you walk into there are like these swinging pendulums of doom you know big saw blades on them actually they kinda look like an anchor just sharp edges and they will completely take you apart and you can actually sometimes see the stranger's face you know going off to the side or something and he still has that one expression on his face that's kind of fun. The puzzles and the plentiful monsters will keep you busy, and the atmosphere is excellent. It's not quite Silent Hill, but it is very good. It's very dark, very moody, very creepy. You always feel like at any moment there could be, you know, a monster attacking. I will say that sometimes they go a little bit far with that. Sometimes they have too many, too powerful opponents fight you at the same time. And this is a little straining. But it doesn't happen that often. I'd actually say a slightly bigger problem is the fact that sometimes this doesn't show you exactly where the enemy is, you know, because of the angles. So you can be being attacked and you might not be able to see the enemy. This is really a problem in the Chicago campaign, because they have Tommy guns, and for those of you who don't know what that is, it's a submachine gun. It fires fast, and when you get hit by a bullet in this game, in fact, pretty much when you get hit, you stop, you know, slightly, so when it's a machine gun, you can be running and you'll be stopped like three or four times in just a couple of steps, and this is bothersome if you can't tell where the enemy is, you know, I mean, you can tell the bullets that miss, they have a nice little effect of, you know, they make sparks fly off the wall. But, this doesn't necessarily mean you that you can tell if they're above you, next to you, beneath you, you know. Also, in the Chicago level, I don't know why, but apparently, Al Capone's men have decided that they just really badly want to drive around in cars 
and shoot at whoever they see walking. I don't know, I guess there's a mobster mandated curfew or something. You'll literally be walking and they'll drive past and shoot at you and sometimes a guy will step off the car and shoot at you. Some of them stand like on top of buildings and shoot down at you. I don't know. I get that they were, you know, fighting off the cops at the time, but it seems slightly strange. I don't know, maybe they were really hoping that this whole Frankenstein, you know, regenerating the dead mobsters thing would really pay off, and anyway. I already said there's a very nice variety to the enemies, and they behave as they should, you know? The stone golems will attack you when your back is turned. You'll see them morph into creatures, and they'll come, you know, running at you, because that's, you know, what they are. They're golems. And you'll turn around, and they'll morph back to just static stone, and you can't destroy the stone. You know, so you have to be really quick about turning around and shooting them so they'll come apart, or turning around, you know, whacking them with something. Vampires teleport, and it's a nice little effect with smoke. The flying ones are quite intimidating, not quite as good as the ones in the first Silent Hill, I will admit, but still pretty good. The werewolves will leap at you and they are humongous. They are like a human being and a half tall and just huge like bears and bigger still. I don't think I've seen werewolves that big. It's actually really cool because in the second campaign you start out in a train and suddenly everyone in the train just as you pass them turn into a werewolf and it's just these you know agonizing wails and screams from the people as they turn and then they're there and they're attacking you and you're in this small little train you can't like run around in circles around them you know that actually brings me back to the characters. There's this really kind of interesting dude, Hiram, who's apparently sort of psychic, and they just barely use him at all because he gets killed at the very beginning of the second campaign, right before you get to control your character, actually, in the opening cinematic. And before that, you just, you can talk to him once at the beginning of the first campaign, you know, before you go on your mission. This moves, like, further and further away from, or, anyway, you don't always start at the spook house. Sometimes you just, you know, start already on the mission. Sometimes you're at the spook house and you can pick up equipment and, you know, health packs, stuff like that. One of the other characters is Svetlana, a half-vampire, half vampire half human female, Dampir is called here, I don't I don't know enough horror supernatural lore to say if that's a common name for it, but think Blade, you know, she has their strengths, not their weaknesses. And a big badass named Moloch, and he's like this small insignificant looking man, and then he transforms into this huge demon that can fly and just has a really deep voice, really intimidating. And there's an ex-boxer. There's a guy called Scat Dazzle who's like a jazz player and he has this kind of voodoo connection with a voodoo god Baron Sa Samdi, I think they pronounce it, who can revive him and use, like, lightning, I think, to attack others. 
very interesting cast of characters. I really wish they had done more with them because some of these you only get to meet like once and then that's kind of it. If they ever somehow make a sequel or I don't know, a television show, a movie, something, I would love to see them delve into these characters. I don't know that many survival horror games that really have that fascinating characters and that don't really do anything with them. I mean, obviously Silent Hill 2 has fantastic characters, but they also go into them. That might be more or less it. The level design is great. You really feel like you are in an old, abandoned, you know, the ruins of a castle or this small southern town where you, by the way, have to, you know, rescue, the, you know, the people who, like, hold up in their uh, little houses. And you, if you walk too far away from one of them, when you join up with them again, they'll say something like, Do you even care if we make it back alive? And the stranger just completely coldly responds, marginally. The, the sense of humor is really great, very black and... Yeah. The stranger has some really awesome quips that I'm not going to give away. Only that one. The supporting characters are also, at least not so bad. The mythology is interesting. I mean, other than it combines all these interesting mythologies for supernatural creatures, we also have some backstory for all four chapters. And it's quite interesting. You know, in the fourth chapter, you know, you're running around this huge mansion full of traps and full of monsters running loose and sometimes you can lure them into the traps and it's just fascinating and solving all these riddles trying to find your way into this madman that has you know captured you there because you can't escape from this mansion so you're just in here and there are you know you're outnumbered maybe a hundred to one of various monsters and you don't even start with your guns intact because he like knocks you out and puts you in a cell with a werewolf it's chained up but still that's messed up man I think that's everything there is to say about the game it's from 99 so you know by now people can't really run it on their computer but if you have an old computer if you find this for sale and if you just dig supernatural horror and survival horror video games, I would definitely say to buy it. It's a lot of fun. I've personally beaten it, I don't know, three or four times, and I never seem to get sick of it. So, that was my spoiler-free review of Nocturne. Hope you enjoyed it. I'll see you next time.